I first came to a new Quist breakfast 18 years ago, roughly, maybe 17 years ago. And what drew me here was that the first thing, one of the first things I read when I got into politics back in my early days was this book. How many of you recognize this book? How many of you have read this book? How unusual is it to you to find somebody else in life who has even heard of this book? I was uh, running for governor in 2012, and I was told that I needed to meet a particular person. And this particular person has a reputation because the federal government decided to go after this particular person and to prosecute him for um, all sorts of things. His name was Rick Kerber. Some of you may have met him. Some of you may know him. He went by the moniker free, the Free Capitalist. And around 2007, he began to be investigated by the federal government, and they started to prosecute him for all sorts of different things. Well, I met him in 2012, and I went into his office, and he said to me, you're either uh, crazy for wanting to meet with me, or, uh, or there's some other reason why we're meeting. And I began to tell him about my background in politics and how I got into politics. And I was a young 28-year-old kid, uh, had been selling cars, and hated it so much that I decided I would do anything that I could to get out of that rut in my life. And so, of course, I decided to run for public office, because what better place for a car salesman than in politics? And, and believe it or not, I won. And I was as shocked as just about anybody else. I probably won because my wife ran my campaign. She's actually here today, somewhere out there. There she is. It's always... Uh, it's a, you know I'm somewhere not too crazy if my wife will come with me. So that bodes well for all of us. And I, I started to serve in the state legislature. I had no idea what I was doing. And people said to me, don't worry, you'll do all right. And I said, why? And they said, because you can formulate a sentence. And sure enough, <laughs> that seemed to be basically true. And you get to the legislature and you kind of think, man, I made it, I made it. And then you look around at all the other people and you think, but how in the world did you people get here? <laughs> and I, I thought, I was in for a real treat as a young legislator in the state of Utah because I thought all these Mormons would be building Zion. I'd be, you know, mingling with former stake presidents and bishops, and they were horrible. The principles were terrible. So I had to turn to other places like this book. And I read this, and I read President Benson's stuff, and I read Verlin Anderson's stuff, and I thought, man, this, that was just how it is. And boy, was I in for some sore disappointment in the Utah legislature. And by 2004, I left to go to law school, came back, I served in the Utah Republican Party, uh, and then ran for Congress against Matheson, and then ran uh, for governor in 2012. And I've always kind of kept these principles with me. So anyway, I'm at this meeting with this guy named Rick Kerber, who had gone through all of his troubles while I was off at law school, so I had no idea who he was. And he says to me, what really guided your philosophies? And I said, well, I read this book. And he said, you got to be kidding me. I did too. And I thought, no way. You know, nobody's ever read that book except for the people at the Newquist breakfast. <laughs> and sure enough, he had read it. And one day we're sitting down. And I, I, I was a lawyer by this time. I was in-house corporate counsel for a company here in Utah. And... He said, you know what, you should start your own law practice. And I had the most averse reaction to that invitation that you can imagine. I was mad at him for even suggesting it. Because by this time, I had been a state legislator, I'd run for public office, and all of it had pretty much been both a wonderful and horrible experience. And I didn't want to have anything to do with politics or the law anymore at that point in time. So I was pretty offended uh, at him for suggesting that I actually be a real lawyer and open my own practice. And boy, the spirit just bugged me about it. 
And so sure enough, I decided I would do it. And I opened my law practice in my garage, literally in the dead of winter, 2012, started my law practice in my garage. I put some plastic around a quarter of the room, built my own desk, because at this point in time, we were just absolutely dead flat broke from running for office. And the next thing you know, things just started to happen. Um, within a year's period of time, we were before the Utah Supreme Court. Uh, we had challenged a long-standing family law policy. Uh, we were also involved in a precedent-setting case that has gone before the Utah Supreme Court as well. And, and amazing things began to happen in my legal, very short, litigation career starting in 2012. Well, let's see if I can actually get to where I want to be. So the reason I tell you about this individual is he's kind of the one that spurred me into practicing law. This individual would be the one who instigated our participation in the Bundy cases. And in fact, if you would like to know who really is responsible for the legal theories and the successes in the Bundy cases, it is my good friend, Rick Kerber. And I'm not sure why that is, except to say that I think by actually having experienced personally the persecution that can come when the federal government decides to literally ruin your life, something happens to you. Because you have to decide if you're going to fight or if you're going to literally roll over and give up. And Rick decided that he was going to fight. And he has fought ever since, like nobody I've ever seen before. And he has become an exceptional legal scholar. And so he was a natural person for me to begin to work with in most of my big cases, whether it was jury strategy or legal strategy for trials. Now, I... Coincidentally, one of his judges was a judge named Magistrate Judge Warner. And Magistrate Judge Warner is a US District Court Magistrate Judge here in Utah. And this quote is from him. He says, if you take a case to trial where you've done something wrong, you'll lose. That's how it works. 95% of the time, they lose. Maybe 98% of the time, they lose. You know why they lose? Because they're guilty. This is the philosophy of the entire prosecutorial arm of the government of the United States, both locally, uh, on a state level, and on a federal level. Now, I missed one, because you need to see these statistics. 91% of people who are charged with a crime in federal court are found guilty. Now, that's before they even go to trial. Okay, this is the 91% who decides not to go on to trial. 77% of, that means they plead out, essentially plead out. They say, okay, we give up, we're done. 77% of those who stand trial are convicted. That means about out of every 100 people charged, 97.93 will wind up guilty. Now, you've heard of the Bundy cases. They were prosecuted in two jurisdictions, Oregon and Nevada. But you probably don't know the behind the scenes story of how it started, how it got to where it was, and how they wound up not guilty in both jurisdictions. Now, I don't have time to tell you all of it. It's a huge story that encompasses almost two full years of legal work, thousands of hours, uh, living in multiple states, and all sorts of attorneys and people who participated in helping secure their innocence and the dismissal of their case in Nevada. But I want to give you a little bit of a picture. I feel like a little bit of a rock star. Uh, I need a guitar here or something, I think. 
with this. Um, it does. That's probably a good idea. Wireless. So the story really begins uh, in the Bundy cases all the way back in the 1800s, which was when the Bundy family settled uh, near Bunkerville. And it kind of gets going in about 1993. And 1993 is when Clive and Bundy decided he was going to cancel his leases with the BLM. He told them, I don't need your help anymore. I'll be okay on my own. And he stopped paying them and attempted to pay through the county of Clark County, Nevada. <clears throat> now, not much happened between 1993 and 1998. But in 1998, a designation was made over the land in Nevada called an ACEC. And I always get this wrong, but it's an area of critical environmental concern. Now, how many of you have been past Bunkerville, Nevada? How many of you have ever stopped in Bunkerville, Nevada? Um, it is not a big place. And when you go into Bunkerville, it it sits against the Gold Butte area. And Gold Butte, the Gold Butte area is a big area that borders Lake Mead, right? Am I getting my Nevada geography correct? And so where the Bundys live and have lived for a long period of time became a point of controversy in the environmental community because environmentalists, specifically the Friends of Gold Butte, which was a kind of a subsidiary organization of a group called the Center for Biological Diversity, which, depending on who you ask, is a fairly radical group of environmentalists who have a very different philosophy than you probably do on how we should use land. And they successfully uh, helped to get this area designated as a, an area of critical environmental concern. And I'm not sure why the pictures are not rendering here. But if they don't render, you're, you're going to miss out on a lot. Um, shoot. That would be a real bummer if none of the pictures end up rendering for you. Sure. So the BLM charges people essentially to manage the land for them. So if you have a pre-existing land right, uh, and, and this is, a, I will not go into this today, but there's a long series of pieces of legislation and statutory changes that were made over time, acts by Congress, which changed the nature of how we manage land in America. Um, and there are even amongst the greatest minds that we have, there are differing views on how that chain of title affects ownership, surface, subsurface rights today. But, but suffice it to say that the government, in Clive and Bundy's view and in my view, so substantively altered the nature of land control that they took control of land back from people through trickery in my opinion. Statutory change over time, but it was trickery. It went from a, a holding of land in a stewardship or private property scenario to the government now saying, hey, look, your land is not really yours. We manage it for you. You have some rights that exist kind of on top of the land and sometimes water rights from underneath the land. And Clive and Bundy looked at that and said, hey, look, I've been here since the 1800s. My rights pre-exist yours and he alleged that he had several water claims that were recognized by the state of Nevada. So he unilaterally canceled his contracts with the federal government. Now, if you ask me as an attorney, I would say that's not a very safe way to protect your land. Because as you and I know, the federal government has more guns and kills more people than almost anybody you know. So if you get crosswise with the federal government, and you last long enough, they're eventually going to kill you or throw you in jail. So Cliven's legal strategy wasn't really going to work in the long term if the federal government decided to make an issue of it, and they did. Um, 
and I really apologize if, if you don't, I might have to just describe a lot of these pictures to you, but it's a lot of the information that has come out of these two cases. Um, and, and that's my fault. I didn't have a, an attachment that would actually work with that projector, so I apologize. In, so in 1998, this area of critical environmental concern is overlaid on top of the Bundy land. And in 2008, a woman named Mary Jo Rugwell is appointed as the Southern Nevada BLM director. And what else happened in 2008? President Obama was elected, and our land policies drastically changed. And we went from <laughs> essentially ignoring many of the disputes between the BLM and landowners in the West to actively pursuing action against landowners in the West. And Clive and Bundy was infamously known as the last rancher in Southern Nevada. And he became a target. And Mary Jo Rugwell was put in in Southern Nevada as the state director and began operations. Now in 1998, during that same time in which this area of critical environmental concern was overlaid on the Bundy land, there was a, an order obtained by the BLM that told Clive and Bundy to stop putting his cows on the land. They said he was trespassing cattle. But between 1998 and 2008, when Mary Jo Rugwell was put in as a director, nothing had been done. A loose record had been kept, but generally nothing had been done since 1993 when Clive and Bundy said, you're fired. Well, in 2008, Mary Jo Rugwell comes in and, and is told to start action against Clive and Bundy. So by 2012, 2011, she with a man named Dan Love from the Office of Law Enforcement Services with the Department of the Interior begin an impoundment operation over Clive and Bundy's cattle. Now they realize that the order that they're operating under is pretty old. It was given in 1998. And so they go back for another order in 2013 and basically sabotage their own impoundment efforts in 2011 and 2012. Now, Mary Jo Rugwell testified in the trials, and later we would learn from her that she had no intention of actually carrying out the same level of operation that you all saw unfold in 2014. But Dan Love, who was there in 2012, had a history that went back even farther than the Bundys in 2011 and 2012. Do any of you know what that is? How many of you ever heard of Dr. Red in Blanding, Utah? Dr. Red committed suicide in 2009. He and two other people, all, who also committed suicide, were involved in an operation called Operation Cerberus, where the BLM, and the Department of the Interior had conducted an investigation into artifact trafficking in southern, uh, in south southeastern Utah. Now, how many of you have been to Monticello, Blanding, Grand Gulch? Have you ever been down to the ruins down there? You can literally walk around and find pot shards, kernels of corn, things like that. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Oak. Now, Dave, you're going to have to warn me. I could literally go on for days here. That's you. All right. How much time do I have? Yeah, you guys are out of luck. <laughs> you're, you're not, you're not, you're not going to get to hear much of anything. I, I don't want to rush it either. I'll try and wrap it all up real quick at the end. But Dr. Red and others, uh, 26 people total, were chased down by the federal government, oh, and, the, and the project was overseen by a fellow uh, from the BLM named Dan Love. And I'm gonna run through these pretty quick. This is, this is actually, uh, you know, you can find anybody on LinkedIn these days. The FBI is not the only one who can carry out surveillance. I can do it too. Um, this is the Mary Jo Rugwell's LinkedIn page, and you can see her history 
And I wanted you to see that because I wanted you to see some of these players. Because if I can take you through this long enough, you're going to see that these players actually wind up looking like conspirators. And they find themselves in very different places involved in very similar operations. Now, Operation Cerberus also had, and this is very difficult to find, but if you go into the filings in the Red families, it's the estate of Dr. Red, sues the federal government, you'll find a deposition by a person named Greg Bretzing. Have you heard that name? Greg Bretzing was an FBI special agent out of Utah who worked with Dan Love in Operation Cerberus in southern Utah where three people took their own lives. Dan Love would later become the special agent in charge over the Bundy cattle impoundment. Greg Bretzing, who worked with him in southeastern Utah, would become the lead FBI director in Oregon who oversaw the Malheur Wildlife National Refuge occupation and carried out the investigation against the Bundys. Dan Love would become the special agent in charge of Nevada, who would oversee the impoundment of the cattle of the Bundys in Nevada. It's a strange interweave, interweave tale. Now, uh, Dan Love actually received his promotion to special agent in charge after carrying out his investigations against Dr. Red and others in Operation Cerberus in 2009. And that's how he got involved in the Bundy case. Now, in 2011, I'm gonna skip over a lot of this. Uh, I told you about the orders that were entered and eventually uh, in 2014, you're all, I pulled this from my Facebook page. You're you familiar with that picture? I, I had nothing to do with the Bundys, uh, except I knew Ryan Bundy from politics down in Cedar City, Utah. But when I saw that picture, I knew something was happening. And in 2014, the date on that is April 16th, which is about four days after the impoundment operation on April 12th. I, I had an inclination that something was going on that is a man with a rifle. His name is Eric Parker. And how many, uh, you've, you've said you've been to Bunkerville. There's a place called Toquap Wash. Every one of you has driven over it if you've driven to Las Vegas, Nevada. Toquap Wash is what he's overlooking. It's where the impoundment operation occurred. And um, in, uh, this is one of your favorite people, right? I can hear the sighs already. Um, this is six days after the impoundment operations, which ended on April 12th, 2014. Six days after, Harry Reid says, Cliven Bundy does not recognize the United States. He says that the United States is a foreign government. He doesn't pay his taxes. He doesn't pay his fees. And he doesn't follow the law. He continues to thumb his nose at authority. He then states, what went on up there was domestic terrorism. Reed stated that he, that he had spoken. Now, this is, this is something you, you don't quite fully understand until you've really been sitting in this case for a couple years. And it didn't hit me until Nevada. He said that he had spoken with Attorney General Eric Holder FBI leaders and Clark County Sheriff Doug Gillespie and said he understood at that time, this is at that time in 2014, that there was a task force being set up to deal with Bundy. Now that was a lie and he knew it because the task force had been set up in 2011 and they had labeled the Bundys as domestic terrorists before this alleged task force was ever stated publicly by Harry Reid. And that task force finds, now let me, before I say this, let me give you one more thing. Reid essentially lays out within six days 
of the impoundment operation the elements necessary for the detention of the Bundys permanently. How? How do you, what, what, what authority do you get to detain a person indefinitely in DAA? He lays out within six days the elements necessary to indefinitely detain the Bundys as domestic terrorists and claims that they come up with this idea after the impoundment operation. Absolute fabrication. They had orchestrated this purposefully to eliminate competition. And we'll go into that a little bit more. Now, I also posted shortly thereafter, again, having no idea I would ever be involved in this case, something about the Red family down in southern Utah and Operation Cerberus. Again, having no idea the connections between these people. Now, I skip all the way to 2016 because you may not know this, but in 2014, after the impoundment operation ended and they let the cows go, everybody thought it was done. In fact, I see one of Lavoie's daughters sitting out here in the crowd. Um, Lavoie Finnecum went on Brian Hyde's radio show, right? Brian, wasn't that your show? And he described what they were going to do as a result of the Bunkerville standoff, which they thought they had won. They thought they had obtained a victory for the West. Well, it turns out the FBI was laying a plot and a plan to make sure these men never got to do this again. And Lavoie got on Brian's show and he said, you know what, we're gonna go from one place to another and we're gonna help every single cattleman who needs our help. We're gonna stand with them against what has become an oppressive federal government which is trying to steal our land and our rights. And so in 2015, a small group of these men head to a place in Eastern Oregon where the Hammond family, uh, Stephen Dwight Hammond, have recently been released from jail. And they, uh, they're released from jail because the judge cannot give them uh, he says, it's unconscionable for me to give these men the mandatory minimum sentence, which is five years, for setting a backburn. And a backburn means there's a fire coming down off the public lands, and it's going to take over your ranch, and so you start a fire to burn against it and to stop it coming down. And there's a law that says if you do that and you burn public land, you're forgiven because it's a way we manage our Western lands. Well, they can't get the Hammonds on that law, so they punish them under the Anti-Terrorism Act for arson, which carries a mandatory minimum of five years. The judge says, no way, I'm not gonna do it. They get out of jail one year later. The Oregon US District Attorney says, no way, put those men back in jail, appeals it, it's upheld by the Ninth Circuit, and the men go back to jail for five years. They're still sitting in jail today. And so Lavoy, Ammon, Ryan Bundy, and others head out to Malheur uh, to a place called Burns, Oregon, where they protest. And they decide to occupy the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. I you to Nevada because Nevada is where everything really comes out. Um, because most of this stuff you're hearing me say, we didn't know. When we, uh, well, when we went to, or well, let me, let me back up. The, the occupation took place in January of 2016. And while they were there, I told you about my friend Rick. Rick calls me on the phone and says, do you want to go to Mal here with me? And I thought, what for? <laughs> you know? And this was literally a day before Lavoie Finnegan was killed and Ammon was arrested. And he doesn't wait for me. He says, I'm not gonna go. And then he wakes up at two o'clock in the morning with an impression he needs to go to Malheur. He hops in his car with another grizzly bearded dude 
and Rick is a grizzly bearded dude who fits right in with all these other guys out at Malheur and drives all the way to Burns, Oregon, sits down with Lavoy Finnicum, Ryan Bundy, and Ammon Bundy and has a conversation and says, let me help you because trouble's coming. And it's amazing to me as I review this history because I've got all these communications from him on Facebook. And so I'm able to go back and, and retrace all these steps of how we got involved. And Rick leaves there that same day and comes back and calls me and says, we need to help them. Well, Ammon hired a different attorney, so there's not much we could do. But by February, almost a month later, Ammon realizes he does need our help because their case is already sinking. And Rick ends up writing a brief for Ammon's attorney at that time, his name is Mike Arnold, which garners national attention because we changed the rhetoric in the case. Most defense attorneys out of Oregon are liberal and they're wonderful people. They love civil liberties. I, one thing I've noticed in the law is it's all the liberals who are fighting for civil, civil liberties in the courts. All the Republicans go become oppressive prosecutors, unfortunately, because they're tough on crime, which is a Republican mantra. And, but what they don't understand is how to carry out a defense that is not based upon a victimhood mentality. In other words, please don't prosecute me. All I was doing was protesting. So we wind up in Oregon in June of 2016 for our very first defense meeting with 26 other defense attorneys because there are 26 defendants in the Malheur National Wildlife Occupation case. And those guys could not run fast enough from us. They did not like me. We had hired Marcus Mumford in June of 2016 and brought him in as our head litigator for the trial in Oregon. And they didn't like any of us because we walked into the room and we said, we're not going to be victims. We are not going to claim that we were mere protesters. We are going to allege that we were adversely possessing the federal government's property. They went nuts. I was sitting in the room writing to Rick as I listened to these defense attorneys ridicule us, literally ridicule us, and every single one of them left, refused to go to trial with us except for six. Out of 26 defendants, we had one of them sit in the back of the courtroom and literally say, and I apologize for my language, but this is how they are in Oregon. He sat with his client and said, these guys are effing stupid. His client went to jail after we won acquittals for all of the defendants because they refused to embrace adverse possession. Now, adverse possession wasn't the best theory, but it was all we had. So I'm sitting in this meeting where these defense attorneys are literally running from us as fast as they can. And, and Rick writes to me, anyone who thinks it's a better narrative to argue that these people are simple trespassers still has to explain why change the sign, why block the entrance, why say we're staying for years, why deal with the land records, why take over the offices, why inventory the artifacts, why make roads. That's more, far more than trespass. Now remember, this is June of 2016, long before we went to trial. On the other hand, the law on adverse possession is the language of lawfully ousting a legal owner. That was the theory we took. It was a theory we stuck with. It was the theory that won. This is the picture he sent me when he said, are we really going to claim that they were just trespassing protesters? I love that picture. Um, one of the most rational voices at Malheur. Uh, but this is what we were dealing with. I don't know if you guys know this is Sean Anderson. He was one of the holdouts, one of the final four, they called them. And things went a little bit crazy there at the end. So we knew we had a challenge. Now, what's funny is the judge in Oregon took judicial notice that adverse possession wasn't legit. That the federal government owned the land and they thought they had shut us down. 
Well, what they didn't know is that we had Ammon Bundy ready to go as a witness. He was unconventionally going to be our lead witness. And it's not often as a criminal defense attorney that you want to put your client on the stand. But we wanted Ammon on the stand. And we put him on the stand for days, literally days. And what the, what the government didn't know is that we had these pictures where Ammon had, actually, had actually written the word adverse possession in his teachings. And there were multiple of them. And every time we put one of these pictures up, they tried to protest and object. But we had pictures of him teaching adverse possession everywhere. And it stuck in the jury's heads. And we ended up winning in Oregon. Uh, not thanks to any one particular person, but because those who remained, which were six of us, uh, maybe seven, I'm trying to remember now if it was six or seven, uh, were committed and faithful. And uh, we got full acquittals for all of them. They were the only acquittals in Oregon. All those other defense attorneys who ran away, all those other clients that they scared out of that trial, all wound up with convictions. So we did not have a lot of the information we then discovered. And again, there's so, there's so much information I wish I could share with you. But we knew also as a defense team that Ammon's legal strategy could not begin and end with Oregon. It could not. We knew that once we were done with Oregon, there was a problem in Nevada because the moment Ammon Bundy walked into Burns, Oregon, the sheriff of Harney County got on his computer, pulled up Ammon's name on the law enforcement database, and guess what it said? Danger, domestic terrorist. And from that moment, his posture with Ammon changed, and we had to figure out how it was that Ammon had become a domestic terrorist because he participated in the 2014 impoundment. Now, we couldn't deal with that in Oregon because we were foreclosed from saying anything about the federal government or their behavior. So we had to go with that adverse possession theory, right? We had to change the mind of the jury. And a, a, a great story on the last day when the jury read the verdict in Oregon, the foreman was this poker face guy who seemed to fall asleep half the time, totally disinterested. He walked into the courtroom, sat down in his chair, had the verdict form, and when the judge called on him, he stood up, he read the verdict, or he said, you know, we have a verdict, sat back down, and the judge then read each one. He folded his arms like this, leaned back in his chair, looked over at Ammon Bundy, and nodded his head just like that full acquittals across the board. Now, that was based on, again, adverse possession. We had to try and talk this jury into a different theory than essentially domestic terrorism and conspiracy. Because this is the response that these men got 30 miles outside of town. That's how far out of town they were. But at the Burns Airport, the government literally brought in all these military-style Bearcat vehicles, helicopters, and hundreds of law enforcement officers. So we were combating a narrative. Uh, this, I gotta explain this one to you. This was a key piece of evidence that the government used against the Oregon occupiers. These men are shooting like thousands of rounds of ammo. They went down to the boat dock at the refuge. They lined up and went through a routine drill on how to fire weapons and being the zealous fellows they were, they shot like 2,000 rounds and left them all laying on the ground. Well, guess what? It turns out that the person who orchestrated this little event was a government informant. He talked them into going down there, got them to shoot the rounds. We put him on the stand, questioned him, and got him to admit that he'd done all this. And so the government had really an upper hand in Oregon. And... By the time we get to Nevada, um, this guy, remember his name, Dan Love, is fired for corruption. Now, we were supposed to go to trial. 
We end the Oregon trials in October of 2016, and we're supposed to be going to trial four months later in Nevada. So while we're trying to finish off Oregon, we've got four months now to get ready for an even bigger trial scheduled to take about four months. The Oregon trial was two months. We've got to be in Nevada by February for a four-month trial. Now, remember, this is by February of 2017. Fortunately, unfortunately for Ammon, who had to stay in jail this entire time, was subjected to significant amounts of abuse, months of solitary confinement. Ammon wanted out. But we could not afford to just go to trial because there were so many unanswered questions. And so the trial was split and delayed in Nevada, fortunately. And we went to trial in October of 2017. By September of 2017, this man, Dan Love, the head of Operation Cerberus in southeastern Utah with the Red family, who was also the special agent in charge of the impoundment operation in Nevada, is fired for corruption and removed from office. Greg Bretzing, his friend, also involved in Operation Cerberus, who has transferred to Oregon and oversees the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge Occupation, resigns relatively in disgrace after the Oregon acquittal. We don't begin to discover the corruption that went into all of these cases until we get to Nevada. And in Nevada, after now remember, this is two years previous. The Bundy family, at the behest of my co-counsel, Dan, Dan Hill, goes out into a, a local waste disposal company's shop and finds these bags of shredded documents from the impoundment operation. Now, we were not allowed to pursue this issue in Oregon. But I'm going to wrap it up here because, because it, it, uh, i gotta, I got to get done. This, this shredded information, we were foreclosed on from investigating until we got to Nevada. And, and foreclosed on investigating it until October of 2017. Once we were allowed to open this door to, to how these documents got shredded, we found a rabbit hole of corruption that began in 2012, including an FBI threat assessment on the Bundy family that said, these guys are not a threat. Now, the government suppressed and hid all information that indicated the Bundys were not a threat. And instead, in their superseding indictment, which is how you get a person, it's a charging document. If I want to take you to court, I've got to charge you. And that happens in the superseding indictment. And in the superseding indictment, they allege that the Bundys had lied purposefully in order to entice people to come to Nevada in 2014 to carry out an armed assault against the federal government. The Bundys said, no, we didn't. Our brother Davey went out on the road to take pictures of federal snipers who had been watching over our house 24-7. Now, you have to understand that the Bundys live in Bunkerville. And this is a horrible map. It's the one that's actually out of uh, evidence. So I'm going to show you the, the Google map instead. This is I-15. And if you drive down here, I believe this is the Bunkerville turnoff right here. Uh, am I getting that right? And there is one road, and it is a dirt road right here. Come off I-15 to Bunkerville, take a dirt road out to the Bundy home right over here. One dirt road in and out. Turns out the federal government had set up through the FBI, a forward operating base 1.6 miles from the Bundy home, blocking all ingress and egress, 
had placed cameras for surveillance on both sides of their homes and had stationed 24-7 snipers and surveillance around the Bundys before the impoundment operation ever began. The FBI's own threat assessment said, do not do those things. If you do those things, you may create a barricade situation where the Bundys hole up and call people for help. Guess what the Bundys did? There are people here, as in Ruby Ridge, who are going to kill us. They've already beat Davey Bundy up and taken his information from his iPad to prove that they're here. And now they're surrounding us with snipers. The government came in and said, no, we didn't. We didn't do that. Well, it turns out they had. And not only had they done that, they had been prepping. This, this is just one example. This is an attack dog. This is a BLM uh, agent dressed in a dog suit. And they're teaching the dog to attack protesters. Almost within days, Ammon Bundy discovers that the BLM is not only trying to impound their cattle, but is ripping out their property, which they do not have an order to do. He goes, he jumps up on a truck, looks inside, and sees that the government is ripping out their water infrastructure, which is how you claim rights to land in Nevada when you have water rights. The government's removing them illegally. He sees this in the back of the truck. Guess who comes out? This guy with this dog. Just as they've been training to do, six the dog on Ammon. Unfortunately, Ammon's a tough dude. He's been tased twice. He kicks the dog in the head, and the dog runs away. <laughs> now, to make a long story short, that those bags of shredded evidence led us to information about the FBI's forward operating base, about the training they engaged in to provoke the Bundys, uh, about all sorts of information about a, a tactical operations center that the FBI had set up with a joint terrorism task force in Southern Nevada, purposefully designed to orchestrate a scenario where they could accuse the Bundys of domestic terrorism unlawfully detain them for an indefinite amount of time, keep them in jail, paint them as terrorists, take the land, and be done with them. We chased this trail all the way through the shredded documents until we finally filed, as a legal team, the first document to crack a hole in the entire case. And it was our second motion to dismiss. And in that second motion to dismiss, we argued that the government had willfully, sorry, this is, I'll, I'll give you a chance to read this because this is what we're going to end on. Um, pardon the language, but when you practice with attorneys, this is the way they talk, except for me. I don't, I don't curse. I'd get in trouble with the wife if I did. Um, we, we filed a, a motion to dismiss for a mistrial, which basically opened a can of worms, led to the discovery of all kinds of suppressed information and conspiracies that had been used to incite, provoke, and unlawfully arrest the Bundys. And as a result of all of that, it cracked the whole thing open. The judge ended up dismissing with prejudice, and uh, we were able to gain all the information we should have had in Oregon to show that there was a significant amount of corruption going on. Now, one last thing. This is actually the email I received from one of the attorneys in Oregon. This is the kind of response people had, though. This, thing, this kind of thing doesn't happen. I don't believe for one moment that we were responsible. There is no doubt in my mind God had a hand in this case. This guy was one of the most foul-mouthed guys I've ever met. This is incredibly mild for him. But this was the response people had to these cases, these attorneys. We came out of this case with an unbelievable bond 
with these fellow defense attorneys, liberal, conservative, you name it, who found in these cases an ability to truly stand for the Constitution. And because of all of this work, in November of 2017, we received this gym from a guy named Wooten. And it was a whistleblower letter. And Wooten came forward in November of 2017 and stated that he had been fired as the lead investigator over the Gold Butte operation because he had discovered that within the operation, I'll read you a few of his statements. I was asked to lead a comprehensive investigation into the largest and most expansive since I was asked to lead an investigation into the largest and most expansive and important investigation ever within the Department of Interior. The longer the investigation went on, the more extremely unprofessional, familiar, racy, vulgar, and bias-filled actions, open comments, and inappropriate communications I was made aware of. At any given time, you could hear subjects of this investigation open, openly referred to as retards, rednecks, overweight women with big jowls, tractor-faced idiots, inbreds, etc., etc. I became aware of potentially captured comments in which our own law enforcement officers bragged about roughing up Dave Bundy, grinding his face into the ground, and Dave Bundy having little bits of gravel stuck in his face. My superior instigated the unprofessional monitoring of jail calls between defendants and their wives. I had my own supervisor tell me that former BLM SAC Dan Love is the BLM director's boy, and they indicated they were going to hide and protect him. I was told of threats of physical harm that this former SAC, which is special agent in charge, made to his subordinate employee and family. Additionally, it should be noted there was a religious test of sorts. The investigation indicated that on multiple occasions, Love specifically and purposefully ignored directions, orders, ordered, order to command, and ordered the most intrusive, oppressive, large-scale, and militaristic trespass cattle and pound possible. Additionally, this investigation also indicated excessive use of force, civil rights, and policy violations. This came at the very end of the trial. Imagine if we had had that in Oregon. Imagine if we had had this for every single defendant. The United States government has begun to carry out and is continuing to carry out militaristic operations within the Western United States to capture land and to remove people from the land and label them as domestic terrorists. Now, lest you think this is over, our own congressman, Chris, not, sorry, not Chris, John Curtis from Provo is right now sponsoring a bill to further militarize our own public lands in the state of Utah. Specifically, he wants 10 law enforcement officers to protect the antiquities of the land through a special law enforcement team just like the one created in the Bundy's case. And that's happening right now. After all of this, we still have this movement to militarize our lands and to militarize federal presence in the West through the use of domestic terrorist budgets, which we were told in Oregon, for the Bundy's only, amounted to $100 million dedicated to the investigation and the prosecution of the Bundy family. Now, I can't go on, but that should give you an idea 
of the task that is before us in protecting our Western lands and the significant legal battles that lie ahead. They are huge. And to be up to that task, there's a charge given us by President Benson in the beginning of this book to uphold the institutions of free government. One of those institutions are the courts. And I heard over and over and over, the courts are broken. The courts are broken. But guess what? We won twice. In a situation where you're supposed to lose almost all the time. God wants us to win. He wants to help. But he needs our significant efforts in understanding the law and defending it not just in our halls of legislature, but in the courts as well. That's all I have time for. Thank you very much for letting me be here.